Welcome to the MTD CNC podcast. I'm Giovanni Albanese hosting today's show, a passionate engineer and a proud member of the MTD team. Today we're going to be discussing why coolant is probably, the, or if not, the most overlooked uh, part of the engineering process and the reasons why this is and how this needs to be changed. Today we're at ETL Fluid Experts in Yorkshire and I'm joined by James Byron. Managing Direct, welcome, uh, well, or shall I say, uh, thank you very much for having us, James. Welcome, Gio, you're most welcome. <laughs> and we're also joined by our very own Lindsay Vickers uh, and our lead presenter at MTD. Wow, thank you very much, Gio. Um, I just want to set the scene for all of our listeners here, just before we begin. Um, we're in a beautiful, really swanky boardroom, beautiful lighting everywhere. We're all sitting down, we've all got a nice drink or a warm coffee. I can see a Jägermeister in the corner of the room, James. What's that doing here? Why can't we crack that one open? It's a two litre bottle. Um, <laughs> the reason that's there, I had a customer once who liked to do a Jägermeister or two before a, a business meeting, and so it's kind of a hangover from that. Um, if I get a sore throat, I do like to take a nip during yes. the meeting. <laughs> Generally, without explaining it to anyone, just bring this two litre bottle out, whack it on the table. <laughs> And just pour it and have a little swig and see. Brilliant, I like that. Well, we need to start. We need to go crack that bottle open. It looks like you've had a good go at it already, James, to be fair. And Lindsay, you can have a, a drink, actually, because you've been chauffeured up here today. Yeah, OK, maybe. Just give us a few moments. <laughs> well, today is, is a little bit different. Um, usually we've kind of uh, done a bit of preparation for the podcast, but today we're on it. It's an unexpected podcast that we've decided to do today because we feel it's so important the subjects that we're going to be discussing now James we've been filming here all day and looking at the the coolants that you supply but more importantly the management of the coolants and the products that you got to make make um, and they're British uh, manufactured that support the coolants that you sell can you firstly can you start by answering the, the, the kind of title that I said in, in regards to why are people overlooking coolant? Why is it such an overlooked um, part of the engineering process? A question we ask ourselves almost every day. Um, it's funny because coolant, it's our world, it's all we think about, and I am conscious that in a manufacturing environment it's one of any number of uh, important issues to think about, but I do think it gets a raw deal. and. I think there's probably two explanations um, looking at it from different perspectives. I think from one side, I think there's been quite a lot of um, mediocre suppliers of metalworking fluid in the industry that have been quite happy just to let customers crack on and waste fluid because it's good for barrel sales, quite simply. Um, and I think that, that, that definitely is, is, is part of it on the supply side. That we've not been a brilliant industry in the metalworking fluid side in terms of working with customers, adding value, really kind of putting best practice into place. And that's always been one of our constant disappointments is when we go on site and everything bar the coolant is absolutely fantastic. Everything is next generation. Everything is, you know, lots of investment, shiny floors. And the, the, the coolant practices are something from 20, 30, 40 years ago. Not much has changed. And so I think that, that definitely is partly our industries to blame for not being more dynamic and, and not kind of taking the innovation to the customer. So what you're saying is, James, that you don't believe that uh, coolant has evolved in the same way as all the other technologies have, or, or maybe it has evolved, but it hasn't been embraced? Coolant's evolved over the years, yeah, definitely formulation changes and some improvements and some kind of um, changes to, to legislation. So REACH was a, was a big game changer for the industry, took away a lot of additives that were otherwise available and readily available and, and cheap and kind of changed the, the playing field a little bit. But going back to what I said before, I think there's, there's kind of two aspects to this. The first one is um, our industry, our the metalworking fluid industry, not necessarily pushing innovation and not necessarily pushing best practice and I think that in the old days in particular was partly because there's a conflict of interest between uh, an oil company making their fluid last longer and the sales guy needing to get barrels through the front door and to get commission. So real kind of conflict of interest there. Um, I think over the years what that's done is it's built up a, a perception in, in metalworking fluid users' minds that Metalworking fluids are all kind of much of a muchness. They're basically just a commodity. They're a necessary evil. And it's something that you should basically save as much money as possible on by 
getting the barrel price down. So there have been advancements and there are definitely advantages to using a, a higher performance metalworking fluid. But I think so many people are just so fatigued by seeing the same old, same old uh, over the years from the market at large. Uh, and I think they just kind of got to the point where they just assume that what they've got now is pretty much as good as it gets. So people are losing confidence effectively is what, what you're saying, or that they've lost confidence and they just assume that, that one is the same as the other but they maybe are unaware of the solutions that you offer. Now, ETL fluid experts, you know, we've learned a lot today, haven't we, Lindsay? And I think that what really st stands out for me are the savings that can be made. And they're not just little savings, they're astronomical savings. And when you look at reducing cost per part, I'm just flabbergasted that MDs of companies are, are not looking into these potential savings. And when we're talking savings, though, how are you as a company able to quantify that to the customer? It's easy for some companies and it's harder for others. So it really depends on what's being made, in what quantities. So uh, one of the, 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 the sort of big potential savings from getting coolant right would be increased tool life, for example. So it's very easy to measure increased tool life if you're running a, a, a sliding head and it's producing thousands of parts in a week or a month. That's really easy, very data driven. If you're a jobbing subcontractor doing different materials and different parts every day, very difficult to get a, a sort of a level playing field to see what benefit there is from changing metalworking fluid. So it's different, it's horses for courses and, and before anyone changes to our metalworking fluid or anyone's metalworking fluid, we always, um, we always go for a trial. It's quite normal in our industry. And I think a trial is a fantastic way of, of um, the supplier putting their money where their mouth is. We do a kind of no win, no fee trial. So we'll put the equipment in, we'll put the fluid in, we'll clean the machine out, we'll let it run. Uh, and we won't take any payment until such time as the customer has signed off on, on the trial. Now, a successful trial will be different for every single customer. Some people are looking to hit some kind of, you know, uh, productivity um, targets. Some people are looking to reduce cycle times. Some people are just looking for a fluid that smells nice and makes the machines nice and clean. Um, so that everyone has different kind of criteria for, for what would give them the, uh, the motivation to move. And we've just got to kind of tailor our um, trial requirements to, to what the customer is looking for. Uh, and likewise, a trial might take three weeks, it might take three months, it could even take a year. I mean, like we always mentioned, it's, it sounds like it's all application specific. Everyone is, is, is completely different and you've got to handle one, each one independently. Now, let's talk about, you know, not just the coolant, James, because you started your business without coolant. So let's talk about the management of the coolant and the products that you supply to get the best out of the coolant. It's something that you've just alluded to previously. Yeah, so I think when you're looking at um, fluid management, it's the most important aspect of getting value for money from whatever metalworking fluid you're using. Um, and I'd even go so far as to say that if the practices aren't in place, you won't get all the benefits of the high performance lubricant anyway. So it, it really is kind of starting from, from, from the ground up and, and looking at how the fluid moves through the workshop and making sure that we're getting the most from the fluid at every, every step of the way. So we, we don't typically um, work in the same way that, that an oil company does. We look at the value for money, we look at the um, product life, we look at the spin-off benefits from managing it better. Uh, I'm not sure if I've answered your question now. Yeah, you have, you have uh, in a roundabout way. I want to kind of touch upon all of the products um, later on in this podcast that you offer and, and, and the different products and the different applications that, that they offer. Um, Lindsay, what have you learned from today? What's really stood out for you? Well, we've been able to go on a bit of a tour around the facility, and what I've learned is how you clean all the fluids, and I was really, really interested in that, and maybe people don't quite understand that. Is that, would you say? They don't understand that whole process? Yeah, I mean, again, it varies. Some, some customers are much kind of more progressed in terms of looking after the fluid than others, um, but if we go into a typical workshop, it's never a surprise to see tramp oil. It's never a surprise to see swarf causing all kinds of issues building up in the sump. So that a lot of the things that we kind of um, look to improve upon are common faults, common experiences. But it's so interesting that you say that you have walked into workshops and am I right in thinking that you've seen people just throw all of like is it the coolant back in? 
Yeah, that's one of our customers who, uh, <laughs> for some reason, I think what happened is they topped the machine up, which is good. We encourage people to top the machines up. That's a, that's, that's a good start. But they topped it up whilst all the pumps were running, so the, the, the system was, was uh, nice and low. Filled it basically up to the brim, and then all the pumps stopped, and it dumped another 150 litres of coolant into the tank, which subsequently went all over the floor. So the, the mop and bucket comes out, and they're kind of ringing the, 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 the mop to get the coolant back out, and, and they were about to tip it back into the sump if we oh, hadn't no. stopped them. So that's not normal, but um, I've almost stopped being surprised by these things. It, 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 it's not unusual to see some fairly impressive organisations, again, with amazing equipment, and just not paying the attention to detail to the, to the fluid. Yeah, I'm, I'm just absolutely fascinated because out in the workshop we can see some of the products that you make and of course we will come on to it but you're really just trying to make an engineer's life easier like what you're saying what you said earlier and I'll repeat it to our our listeners is the fact that you are trying to make it so an engineer can actually concentrate on the machine the part the the software and not so much you know the kind of not I don't know if you want to call it, but the manual labour of having to do that. And that's something you're trying to automate, aren't you, really? Yeah, um, mainly because experience has taught us that if you don't automate it, it doesn't happen. Or it certainly doesn't happen anywhere near as often as it should. And then, and then there isn't a coolant problem for a little while. And then all of a sudden there is, and we get called in because there's some issue that they attribute to coolant. And you, you kind of delve into it a bit deeper and the sump's been filled up with pure water or there's been some other kind of coolant management issue. And that then um, gives you an issue with, with, with the metalworking fluid, ultimately. You're, you're kind of saying people are more reactive as, being to, as opposed to being proactive by just sorting it out in the first Yeah, it, 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 looking after metalworking fluid is not particularly difficult. There's no real sort of um, secrets to it. It's fairly simple, but it needs to be done every day. Um, and I say that the, the potential is that you can get away without doing it every day for a certain period of time and then you start to pay the price for it and, mm -hmm. and where coolant management goes right is when one of two things happens either when someone's given ownership and you literally have someone going around looking after the coolant in all the machines rather than leaving it to the individual operators or you automate it those are the kind of the two ways that it seems to work best if not in an average workshop, you'll have a mixture of super diligent operators, not so diligent operators, and, and the third category, which I'm sure you can guess is, is the you know, people who really don't pay any due care attention to the coolant. And so you get different experiences within the same workshop, same coolant, it could be our coolant, it could be anybody's coolant. You can break a very high quality coolant by not looking after it properly. If you've got um, diligent operators, they need a relatively um, low concentration top up, for example, because they're topping up little and often. So they're replacing a little bit of water that's evaporated away and a little bit of product that's been carried away on the swarf. Uh, same machine, or same type of machine in the same factory, same water, same coolant, different operator. That operator avoids topping his machine up and lets it get down to the point where it alarms out before he tops it up. He needs a much stronger concentration to actually bring his machine back up. Otherwise, he's going to have issues with uh, with, with concentration in, in, the, in, the, in the machine. And over a period of time, the guy who, or the lady who's topping up regularly and often, that machine will work nicely. There won't be any particular issues. The machine that's been allowed to run very, very low and potentially um, have topped up with a weaker concentration than it should, you're gonna get all kinds of issues with that machine. And without knowing the history and without knowing the, the, the cause of the problem, that's something that could get blamed on coolant, but is absolutely a, it's a management issue. And so, We've been through the cycle with our customers of bringing them all into a room, giving them you know, half a morning of training, a PowerPoint, whatever it happens to be, giving them a little certificate, coolant competency. Um, and that works in some cases and doesn't work in others. And generally, it works for a while before people fall back to their old ways. And so if that cycle happens enough times, my mantra now is if you can't sort of educate, automate. I think, I think education is the key as well. As, as, as education and, and management of coolant is definitely the key. I've got, I've got to admit, when I was on the shop floor, I did overlook coolant myself, and I was guilty, and, and I fall into that category. I put my hand up. Um, um, if you went back on the shop floor, Gio, what would you be doing? I would definitely not overlook <laughs> coolant at all, and, 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 and especially if I was the managing director of a company, I think that, well, from any level in the company, really, from what you're saying, James, like if I was the managing director, 
I would be able to assess the kind of savings that, that looking after the coolant would make me. And, and as mentioned, they're astronomical, not from just cutting tool savings, sump life savings, um, you know, quality of parts, surface finish, and they just go on and on and on and on. But even if I was the, 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 the guy on the shop floor operating the machine tool, to, to, to have that taken away from me, I can concentrate on the role that I'm getting paid to do rather than try to concentrate on filling up the machine tool, keeping the pH levels consistent. Now, going back to the products that you offer, you've actually got an auto top-up product that can service all the machine tools within a machine shop. You know, if, again, if I was putting myself in, 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 the, in the shoes of an MD, of an engineering company, I wouldn't hesitate to invest in this, this piece of technology, James. No, and, and the, the, the cost savings are in most cases quite easy to, to calculate. It's quite easy to, to justify the investment, but it's still going back to the, the initial question, which is why is coolant often overlooked? It's overlooked because it's not viewed from the perspective of, of all of the um, impact it can have on different areas of the business. So if you just look at it within the prism of, of what's spent on metalworking fluid, it's a relatively small part of the, the, the puzzle. But if you then start to think about what impact that can have on much bigger spends, like ultimately the, the, the tooling would be the main one, then all of a sudden the numbers start to get much more interesting. And you're saying that if you were the MD of a company, then you'd, you'd, be, uh, you'd be onto it. The fact is, in a lot of cases, um, the MD or, or someone at that level gets involved when it's a machine tool purchase, but they do not get involved with the metalworking fluid side of things at all. Um, and so that, that's kind of a, um, a, a very real demonstration of, of where metalworking fluid is in terms of its importance in, in some engineering companies. I, I agree, and I, and I agree, but in the, in, the, in the same breath, you know, an MD looks at a machine tool to maybe knock a few seconds off a component, you know, to reduce the cost per part, but effectively the savings that you can make from having the right call and, and looking after it reduces the cost per part significantly in lots of different ways. It's an integral part of the process, isn't it, Lindsay? Yeah, it just sounds like it's almost like an indirect part of the process that people are just overlooking. And like you say, educate or automate. And automation now, we're always talking about automation, but we've really, this is the first time personally I've heard about automating with cutting fluids. I only ever hear automation on the machines. So it's quite interesting. It's kind of opened your mind. But again, we go back to education. And, and, and when we t on, on the theme of automation, we were at Hydrofeed last week, weren't we? Mm -hmm. um, and automation is key to stay competitively, not only with ourselves in the UK, um, amongst other competitors, but globally. And, and again, this falls under that same remit, in my opinion, James. It's absolutely key. Can you just explain about the products that you offer? They're British made, how they work, and the fixed plan that you also offer, because you just it doesn't end with just the products that you offer. Tell us about the other add-ons that you offer in the service. Okay, all right. So a few things at once there then. So the, the product range um, is manufactured under the Cardiff brand. It's manufactured here in the UK, in Yorkshire. Um, we've got a range of equipment that covers basically every stage of a metalworking fluid's life from when it first arrives in the barrel to when it finally becomes waste and everything in between. So what that means is it means automated mixing so you can mix fast and accurately, get a really sort of good emulsion together with a small oil droplet size. So give the metalworking fluid the best chance of, uh, of performing as it was designed to do really kind of accurate fingertip um, concentration changes if you need to tweak up or down in any which way. Lots of safety features. So for example, it won't merrily dispense pure water when the barrel runs out as a, as a common one. Uh, we can put timers in there so that it won't run and run and run and run because people like to bypass whatever um, uh, mechanism you might have in place to prevent overfilling, you know, uh, wedge the pistol grip with a piece of wood and then leave it to fill whilst you go and have your your oh, cigarette oh. break or whatever. Oh, we, we are lazy as a nation. Oops, a daisy, we just dropped something. Um, we're lazy as a nation. We really like, well, I saw only yesterday a picture of bananas being bubble wrapped in cling film uh, with the peel off. Like, what has even happened to us? What is wrong with us? 
don't know. I don't know. It's, <laughs> <It's crazy. laughs> it, is, it is a crazy world for sure. Oh. And I think that um, I think that this is a, a really important subject, though, and I think it's something that we shouldn't be crazy about. Mm -hmm. I think that people that are not investing in this technology are crazy for sure. James, would you agree? So what have we done so far? We've mixed it. And we've mixed it accurately and we've got a nice tight emulsion, small oil droplet size. And then we need to move the metal working fluid around the workshop. Mm. Um, so we can do that in any number of ways. And I've seen customers do it in any number of ways. Oh, no. Best one, um, an old oil barrel um, with the top taken off with a presumer plasma torch or something like that. Still nice and ragged around the edges. And it's on some kind of like dolly I suppose you'd call it so they, they fill up this 200 litre thing and just slop it around the workshop you can imagine as you turn corners there's coolant spilling out over the size of this barrel it looks horrific there's no real control there it's just a health and safety nightmare so we can we can do better than than a barrel with the top cut off so we do a, a coolant bowser so it allows you to move 200 litres of coolant around the workshop nice and safe there's an air diaphragm pump on there so you can um, dispense your coolant for top up in uh, through a petrol pump style dispenser, really quick, because if coolant is easy to top up, people are more likely to do it. If it's a pain, they're less likely to do it. So we need to try and kind of break the back of that, that burden if we can somehow. It sounds like you're, you know, you, you said earlier to us when we were back in the boardroom, you were like, nothing surprises you now. You're problem solving here. You're helping those engineers making their lives as easy as possible. Yeah, and we, we, we see it every day. If I go into a new account, that's where I start. Okay, show me where you mix your coolant. And I watch, watch them mixing it and I watch them moving it around the workshop. And if you did time and motion on that, you know, some of these people with incredibly slow water supplies, mixing coolant into 25 litre containers in 10 at a time to then drag them around the workshop on a pallet truck to then hoik 25 kilos of fluid up onto the, uh, onto the tank and fill it up. It's very, very time consuming. And it probably doesn't get done as often as it should because of that. So, so Bowser number one, uh, we can move on from a Bowser, so we've got our automated mixing station, never run out of oil, uh, nice accurate concentration control, very fast flow rate so you can get the, the fluid topped up quickly and then get on with your day instead of waiting for a, a slow water supply to catch up. You can then connect that mixing station to a pipework system, a ring main that goes around your factory um, with drops to all of your machines. And it could just be something as simple as a, a, a petrol pump dispenser at the end or a valve. So all the um, operator has to do is go to that valve or, or that gun, put some fluid in, maybe 30 seconds or whatever, and it's done. That's pretty easy and takes away a lot of the, the hassle. But it's still not enough for some people. Um, so some people, um, for whatever reason, they, they, they will um, find that too much trauma and they'll wait until the machine alarms out. Or and if it's a shift work, that's, that's the most amazing thing. So, I think metalworking fluid and uh, machine tools, it's a bit like the kitchen bin at my house, which is a strange anal analogy, but stay with me. So when you've got um, split shifts on, on the same machine, then the guy at the, or the lady at the end of the shift goes, ah, doesn't quite need topping up yet. I'll leave it for the next guy, that's their problem. And my kids do the same with the kitchen bin. So they take your banana skin, Lindsay, <laughs> from before, and they open the bin and, and there's just enough space to just precariously balance it, shut the lid, and then it's the next, the next person's problem that comes along. Same thing happens with metalworking fluid when there's when this shifts happening there. So you do get people just going, oh, the next guy will sort it, the next guy will sort it. So the, the final kind of stage of automation on the topping side, we've got our mixer, we've got our pipe work that takes coolant to all of the machines, and then we've got an automatic top-up unit. So it senses with a, with a coolant probe, it senses when the coolant level's low, tops it up, and no one has to touch it. No one has to do anything. I think that it's been a true ed education and there's lots of um, videos on your products that will be released soon on the MTD CNC platform. So if you're listening to this podcast, please visit the MTD CNC website to learn more about ETL and the products that they offer. We're just coming to the end of this podcast, unfortunately. I think we could all talk for at least another half an hour and maybe we need a, 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 a round two. I'd like, personally, I'd like to just end it on another analogy that you used today, James, where you mentioned about the getting the correct processes like giving them the paying for the barrels then effectively they're giving you the, you, they're, they're, pay, they're getting a return of investment plus more back through the savings that they make. You, you mentioned one of your clients that kind of 
was was doing parts. If you could just tell the story about the the, the savings on the cutting tools, um, that that you know. It, it, Astronomical. If, you, if we could leave it on that example, and then your roundup, Lindsay, that would be that be great. Yeah, sure. So this was a customer who who was one of those perfect customers where they did have very good data. They were doing parts consistently, so they could measure. Uh, in this case, it was parts per edge of the tool, um, and it went from seven parts per edge to thirty-seven parts per edge. Everything else the same, just the coolant swap out. Um, so it, it the, the, the rule of these things is you only change one variable at a time, that's how you kind of get some scientific results. Just the fluid was changed, everything else stayed the same, um, no changes in speeds and feeds, seven parts to 37 parts. And if you can look at that as, a, as a, an example of what we can do for tooling, that's, I have to say that's a very good example, but they normally are pretty impressive. But it's anyway. only one aspect, huh? only it's, one aspect only, of everything one aspect, that we discussed. But, but just take that on its own and just, just um, there's normally a ratio of coolant spend to tooling spend and it's about 10 times the tooling spend per the coolant spend ish give or take so if we can save even nowhere near that much if we could just save 20 percent of our um, coolant the tooling spend sorry then the coolant is not only for free but it's actually a profit center and that's as you say just that one aspect just the tool and tool life not thinking about all the health and safety benefits and downtime and and all the other surrounding. I haven't even mentioned the environmental benefits. As we've, well, we've only mixed the coolant so, so far. Much. We haven't cleaned it's it, we haven't recycled <laughs> it, we haven't disposed of it. We've done, we've got at least three more podcasts. Yeah, James, it's been an absolute pleasure. Lindsay, any last thoughts? Yeah, I just find, you know, this is the only interface between the tool and the component. And that is fascinating to hear that it is something that gets overlooked. Um, thank you for your time today, James and Gio. Um, is it time to crack open the Jägermeister? Yes, please. There's actually some Cafe Patron in the fridge, so that's cool. I'd probably rather have a chilled drink than yeah. a, than a yeah. room temperature. I think it's time. It's after five o'clock. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. So let's have a little uh, tipple. So there you have it, the MTD podcast. We're going to go off for a cheeky drink now, but if you've enjoyed this podcast, please comment and subscribe to the podcast. Let us know what you think. If you've got any questions whatsoever, don't be shy to contact ETL Fluid Experts Direct. And that's it for the MTD podcast. Thanks for listening to the MTD podcast. If you found value in this episode, please subscribe and leave a rating and review. Find more episodes on mtdcnc.com.